Welcome to The Budding Writer. This podcast offers an outlet for aspiring authors to showcase their original short stories or fan fiction one-shots. I'm your narrator, Shayna Armand. This is how it works. When you hear this sound, the story will begin. And when you hear it again, the story has ended. This episode, I have the wonderful privilege of reading a short story from a writing duo, Jeffrey Cook and Katherine Perkins. They're on clockworkdragon.net and have several published fictions that are fantasy, sci-fi, and steampunk. I particularly enjoyed their series of books called The Fair Folk Chronicles. You really should check it out. Again, that's at clockworkdragon.net. In the meantime, sit back and enjoy this short story that was set in the time of Norse mythology. Destined by Jeffrey Cook and Katherine Perkins Narrated by Shana Armand A true warrior, Sigrun Grimbjorn's daughter reason, couldn't merely throw a stick for their dog. She needed to be practicing all the time, so that when their father came back to finish her training, she'd be ready. She drew her arm back and launched the long, straight stick she'd found like a spear, arcing it out into the field. The moment it had left her hand, Tearwolf, the wolf dog, Cross, who'd been her constant companion the past four years, took off. Soon he raced back with it in his teeth. Sigrun crouched to take the offered stick and scratched her spear fetcher between the ears. That was a pretty good throw, don't you think? That definitely killed at least one river raider. The big dog sat down, tongue lolling out after the hard sprint, accepting the scratching and tilting his head to help her get the really good spot. You're right, Sigrun agreed. That throw killed at least two. I bet it won't take long at all to get trained when the warriors return, and next year I'll be set to join them. It was a pretty good throw, Breedy agreed, peering into the scrying pool looking in on the girl and her dog. Grimbjorn beamed proudly. That's my girl. The runecaster said she was destined to stand as a great warrior. It won't take much effort to find her new teacher come spring. The vizier nodded, manipulating the image in the pool to draw back, letting the pair look upon the whole village, with the first signs of winter settling around it. I suspect you're right. She has a good arm. Takes after her father. I'd suspect. But you should return to the hall. It's not good for the dead, even here, to pay too much attention to things left behind. Your daughter's fate is her own now. My daughter's fate is to earn her own place at Odin's table. Once she's become a what? He cut off, gesturing to the image in the pool as the image continued to draw back. What's that there? In the hills, he asked. Breedy manipulated the pool again, shifting perspective to cross the vast miles and zoom in on the rising smoke until it settled in on a camp. River raiders, he answered truthfully, a hint of regret in his voice. We scattered them. Burn their boats! Grimbjorn spat. I killed their chieftain myself before they got to us. There's no way they should be on the move again till spring. When the gatherings happen and others realize the North Village's warriors sacrificed themselves to halt the raiders, the vizier agreed, I know your story. The scald in the halls have sung it many times these past few weeks. At his gestures, the image in the pool moved in on a figure with a terrible scar across his throat. Left silent, but ordering men about with gestures in a stern expression as the river raider warriors built up the camp. But it looks like you didn't quite finish the job. These may not make it back home before winter sets in, but they're moving over land and heading south even if he dooms all of the few men he has left in the name of revenge for that scar. Grimbjorn swore, staring daggers at the image as if he might finish what he started through the pool. 
I need to go back. Even if you could, you couldn't kill him. If Odin starts letting fallen warriors do his work on Midgard, Hel would be able to send the damned out as well. I have to try something. That's my home and my daughter. How much time do we have? They're not used to marching. Perhaps a couple of weeks. I'd suggest praying to Thor and Frey, and hope the weather gets them before they get there. My lord, Grimbjorn knelt before the great chair at the head of the hall. Few were permitted to speak to the Allfather directly, but their sacrifice to buy their homes another year had not only earned Grimbjorn's warrior band seats in Valhalla, but provided a fresh story of great courage. I need to go back. What we began is yet unfinished, he admitted. I know we are supposed to eat, drink, and train here until the final battle, but there are legends of warriors given a short span more until they finish their sworn duty. There are five villages within the raiders' reach, and they're on the march, even if winter would take them before they can return. Odin's expression didn't shift. His one eye just bore down on the warrior, as if waiting for something more compelling than mortal lives in fishing villages. Grimbjorn knew what he was asking. While there were stories of warriors being brought back to complete a task before returning to the Great Hall, they were rare, often involved great sacrifice, and risked the balance between Valhalla and Hel. One mistake on his part, should he gain Odin's permission, and countless thousands of lives were at stake. Still, he would do anything it took to see his daughter fulfill her fate. That very thought gave him added inspiration. My lord, I promise to shed no blood, and touch no lives beyond my family. It's my daughter, you see. She's in the northernmost village, the first they'll hit. When she was born, we took her to the Runecasters and asked after her fate. They said she would never follow the path of wife or mother. She was destined to become a legendary warrior, and a thousand foes would die on her blade and on her spear before she fell. Odin's eye narrowed, and his head turned, regarding the pair of ravens perched at the side of his chair. The great black birds, Hugnin and Munin, glanced back, with a single call coming from Munin. Odin turned back, the prophetic words apparently confirmed by his scouts. A small nod was all the indication he gave, but Grimbjorn took it as an invitation to continue. I can't let her die before she's made a warrior. I can't let her go to hell. I need to go back. Not to kill or leave men again. I promised I would return and finish her training. I beg of you. Allow me to keep my word, so the villagers will have at least one warrior to lead, whatever fishermen and farmers can be gathered to defend the land and finish the fight I began. I will pay any price you ask. There was a short pause, and Odin stood. I call for Svipul of my shield maidens. She shall bear witness to your vow. You shall shed no blood. And wage no war, Grimbjorn Arnson. You shall have from Woden's Day to Woden's Day a week's span to complete the training. Svipul shall verify she believes the girl is ready, and when the week's time is past, she will bear you back into this hall. You are lent my shield maiden, and need no other shield. Your left hand is forfeit a payment in blood, and a sign of faith. Should you break your vow, should you fail to complete her training, or should you remain more than one week's time, the Valkyrie will be unable to bear you back here. You will instead be hell's forevermore to stand against your own in Ragnarok. Grimbjorn didn't hesitate. As much as he knew the odds, Faith in his daughter was enough. I accept, my lord. Grimbjorn arrived on Midgard on the back of Svipul's great winged steed. 
the pegasus was sent away before any one could see it and the pair walked the distance to the field sigrun played with tearwolf each day when her chores were done Zvipul frowned you say she's seen only fourteen winters your skill is admirable but how much could she have learned since choosing to walk in your footsteps she's only a child my wife and the other one who'd have been her little brother died in his birthing sigrun kept up the house but she's been learning from me since she was eight she has more of a knack for arms than i had at her age especially the spear you'll see the valkyrie frowned for your sake she'd best it's no small gift odin's given you it would be shame to see it squandered just to bolster hell it's decided and we'll both need your help you and your sisters have more training and skill than any mortal you can pass some of that to sigrun higher standards as well Svipel added i'll not go easy on her or give her any blessing she hasn't earned i'd ask nothing else Grimbjorn began before hearing the sound of running footsteps approaching. A long stick arced through the air, landing not far from where the pair stood. Soon the big grey dog came bounding after it. Sigrun met him halfway back. I'm so sorry, she called towards the two figures. I never see people out here. The pace picked up into a full sprint. Dad! she yelled racing as hard as she could to embrace her father you're back grimbjorn wrapped the arm with the hand still attached around his daughter i am but sigrun drew back but what and who's this she asked mind racing for the possibilities where are the others what happened to your hand sigrun he began embracing her again with both arms this time there were more river raiders than we thought he started an explanation later after some denials and a lot of tears sigrun sat in silence one hand on her father's arm one hand on tyrolf she finally broke the silence eyes shifting between her father and the valkyrie then we'd better get started skills at arms is the first and most essential step to becoming a warrior Spiepel explained while sigrun and her father sparred your father has begun this training she eyed the sparring match noting sigrun's eagerness but also the way she dropped her guard to attack but only begun you have a lot to learn grimbjorn took the hint counter-attacking and explaining where she faltered trying to give his daughter no quarter and the valkyrie no reason to suspect he was going easy on her i'll do better sigrun vowed readying her axe and shield for another round your courage and endurance also remain to be seen the valkyrie continued all the skill in the nine worlds does no good if you turn and flee at the sight of your enemy her nerve will hold grimbjorn assured their overseer as he went into another flurry of attacks testing sigrun's shield reflexes i will make my judgments after your first kill if i consider you far enough along in skill before next woden's day to suggest a hunt find something of suitable strength and make it your own when you take its heart the woman finished harder there's no confidence in your strikes you won't even get to go hunting like this sigrun parried the assault gritted her teeth and struck back the days were on sigrun's home was in disarray the chickens and tearwolf were fed, but all of the housekeeping was set aside in favour of every possible moment of practice. At times, she had begun to despair that she'd ever meet the Valkyrie standards, let alone before Woden's Day. Each time, she fought it back and recommitted herself to training. With two days to go, she was sparring with her father yet again. She fought off his blows more readily than she had and she swore her timing had improved for he had many years of training on her and she just wasn't finding a way through his defence finally in between her father's tips and the overseer's scolding an idea struck her instead of bringing up her shield 
She locked weapons with her father. She knew she wouldn't match his strength long, but only needed a moment. He fell back startled when she smashed her shield into his face. He reached up, the back of his forearm bloodied when he ran it across his lower face. For a moment, Sigrun just kept her guard up, tense and waiting. Then it began. Both her father and Sveeple began laughing. Taking advantage of a one-armed man, her father said. Seeking out and exploiting the enemy's weakness, the Valkyrie corrected, grinning. Very good. You'll need that kind of instinct. Sigrun grinned. Whatever it takes. Exactly, Sveeple agreed. After that, the practice went more smoothly, and on the final day, after a restless night, Sigrun came to the field to find the pair waiting, but no sparring ring traced in the dirt. Today is the hunt. If you make your kill and take its strength for your own, I will try to judge your courage, said the Valkyrie. I make no promises, and time is short, especially for a hunt. But you have your opportunity. What are you hunting? Boar, Sigrun suggested. She knew there were deer trails, a safer bet in many ways than a boar hunt, which often involved a lot more people. But she had to prove her courage and faith in herself now. Sveeple nodded. We won't be able to help you, she reminded the girl. You already have, Sigrun responded without hesitation. Sigrun knew some of the wooded area near her home well enough. She found one of the spots where a number of smaller trees were destroyed and larger ones marked up by a boar's tusks. She let Tearwolf sniff around the area while she encouraged him. From there, they found at least a couple of points she thought a boar may have rested, with similar signs of destruction. Tracking the big creatures, at least, was not the greatest challenge of a boar hunt. They often left significant damage in their wake, tearing up brush and saplings anywhere they stayed for any great length of time. Eventually, Sigrun noticed Tearwolf growing more and more agitated. Once she quieted the wolf dog, she took more care in moving, approaching a small clearing. Though she would have sworn she'd been silent, the boar within the clearing still paused from digging up the roots, sniffing in the air and looking about as if sensing a challenge. Instead of running, as Sigrun feared it might, the big creature pawed at the ground, facing roughly in her direction, while trying to place exactly where it had heard the disturbance coming from. Figuring she had little time, Sigrun stood and launched her spear. The weapon buried itself into one muscular flank. Despite the clean hit, the boar didn't drop, instead charging in Sigrun's direction. Her first instinct was to flee for cover, but she suppressed that, drawing her axe instead as the wild boar rushed at her. At the last instant, she stepped aside and swung her axe. Despite the movement, the tusks caught her along the forearm and one side, opening jagged wounds. The axe did worse to the boar. Even so, it remained upright, struggling to turn about to attack again. Tearwolf leapt to its flank position opposite Sigrun, teeth tearing into its flesh, while Sigrun sunk her blade into the boar's exposed neck when it tried to turn to fight off the dog. By the time it fell, both Sigrun and Tearwolf had a handful of additional gashes and bruises from the fight, but they'd survived, and the boar hadn't. Grimbjorn and the Valkyrie looked on as Sigrun cut the boar's heart free to eventually become her lunch. The rest of the body would feed the village. I need to go home with the sunrise. I want you to know that whatever happens, I'm proud of you, Grimbjorn told his daughter, embracing her once she cleaned up from the hunt. But be careful. River raiders aren't wild boar, and there will be at least a dozen of them, not just one. You mind yourself. Say not a word of me or Sveeple to the village. Call it a vision. If you lead with conviction, they'll follow. Even if they don't know what the Valkyrie has said of your skills. Your skills, the Valkyrie interrupted, are adequate at best. You need more training, more time, but we're out of that. 
What I can't question is your courage. You have the heart of a warrior, and that's what matters most. She gestured for Sigrun to lift her spear, then drew her own blade and tapped Sigrun's spear with the side of her blade. Let no one question it. You are a warrior of the people. You will live as a warrior born, and should you die well, with the same conviction you've shown, then Valhalla will be your reward, and you'll fight at your father's side, come Ragnarok. Maybe there's something to this prophecy, after all. Sigrun did not sleep that night, taking the time to build a small boat. It wouldn't do much beyond floating, but it would do that at least and serve its purpose. When the Valkyrie bore her father back to Valhalla at the break of day, Sigrun, fighting back tears, set the boat alight and launched it. Her father and his band's bodies may have been left to rot where they fell, but they'd have a funeral fit for warriors. The firelight moving down the river drew the attention of others, as did Sigrun's chanting the funeral rites at the top of her lungs. The entire village gathered, joining in the chant without question, before hearing her explanation that she'd received a vision, stating that the warriors had died, and while they'd slain most of the raiders, the rest were coming for revenge, and she was to lead them in preparing. The rest of the week was spent preparing the grounds as best they could. Crude spears and additional bows and arrows were fashioned, walls were repaired and reinforced. A few pits were dug and covered in fields, trying to set traps for the enemy. Old warriors, many years past their best days, trained anyone who could handle the weapon. Messengers were sent to warn the nearest villages and bring back what help they could. Despite the time to prepare, fear was palpable throughout the village. The raiders were bringing trained and armored warriors with metal swords. Even with numbers, there were few who felt they'd stand any chance against the raiders up close. Sigrun did her best to inspire courage in the people around her, and let no one see her have even a moment of doubt. When they finally arrived, the raiders came fast. Though used to traveling by the riverways, as soon as they caught sight of the village, the band came at a full run. At the sound of their taunts, threats, and animalistic shouts, a few of the villagers broke and ran before the raiders even came within bowshot range. Seeing the few remaining defenders on the verge of breaking, Sigrun stopped hiding behind the short stone walls with the archers and climbed to the top instead, raising her spear and shouting back at the top of her lungs, daring the raiders to take their shots because she'd not move until they made her. The first arrows were near things, but as the raiders never stopped to take careful aim, none hit. Sigrun signaled, and the village's own bowmen stood, loosing a volley of arrows at the advancing line. Very few were accurate, but a couple of the raiders fell. A couple of more were wounded, and all of them at least hesitated at the unexpected organization of opposition. Sigrun signaled again, and a second volley went at the raiders, who picked up their mad rush toward the village again. As soon as they were close enough, that Sigrun could make out the chieftain, she cocked her arm back and launched her spear. Whether by chance or observant self-sacrifice, another raider pushed the chieftain aside and was felled by the spear. A few other spears followed over the low village walls, but none as effective as Sigrun's. After that volley, there was no more time. The raiders reached the walls, pulling themselves over while the villagers fought to defend their last obstacle. Sigrun was forced back from the top of the wall to avoid enemy spears, but once amongst the villagers again, she joined the melee. Dropping the first opponent over the wall, the man fell wearing a surprised expression in disbelief at being killed by a teenaged girl wearing a male shirt and a helmet multiple sizes too big for her. Next to her, as a raider was driving back a trio of poorly trained villagers, Tearwolf crashed into the man's side and bore him into the ground. The villagers stepped back in before he could rise, finishing the job the wolf dog started. Sigrun rushed for the chieftain, 
seeking to complete her father's task, another of the raiders stepped into her way, briefly driving her backwards in a way that reminded her of some of her father's flurries in training. Setting her feet, no longer backing away, she managed to lock up his sword with her axe, leaving him defenseless when Tearwolf lunged at him. Sigrun left him on the ground under the dog while she went for the chieftain. Her first attack caught him by surprise, but his reflexes were enough that he only took a deep cut across one arm, instead of the lethal blow she intended. They fought back and forth, steel ringing off of steel, as they moved about the village in the midst of the fierce fighting. Sigrun managed to hold her own, even getting in one strike with her shield across the side of his head. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to fail him. His counterattack came fast and fierce, and while she blocked the first strike with her axe, the impact made her hand go numb enough to drop it. The chieftain's next attack struck her in the shoulder, dropping her to her knees, and the last, a thrust, punched past her chain shirt, biting deep into her side. He kicked her onto her back, glaring down at the girl who thought to challenge him. More of his warriors, struggling with the numbers arrayed against them, despite their skill, drew his attention, and he rushed to aid them, leaving Sigrun bleeding out rapidly. She felt around for her axe as her vision began to fade. Instead, a sensation began returning to her hand. She felt something warm and furry, even as she heard a whine. Turning over painfully, she saw Tearwolf, with a spear stuck through his side, and deep knife wounds along his flanks. Despite the injuries, he drug himself back to his mistress, with a spear clutched between his teeth. Sigrun struggled back to her feet, with the fetched spear, fighting off dizziness long enough to set herself. Biting back a cry of pain, she found her target and launched the spear. This time, it buried itself in the raider chieftain's back, plunging through his heart. When the warriors around him turned, they were overrun. Sigrun fell to her knees again, then pulled herself to Tearwolf, huddling against her beloved dog as they both bled out on the battlefield. Good boy, she whispered before breathing her last. She had a warrior's funeral, Breedy assured Grimbjorn as they sat at the feasting table. And rightly so, answered proudly. She saved the village. But what about the prophecy? That she'd be a great warrior and thousands would fall before her. She'll slay her thousands, Grimbjorn answered as he watched his daughter feeding Tearwolf table scraps from her place at Odin's table. But now she'll be on our side when she does. I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed producing this particular short story. Not only did I get to show off my ability to change my voice slightly, but I also just enjoy Norse mythology in general. I have to say that when Catherine sent me this as a favor because I'm short of writers right now, I said, whoa, whoa, I only asked for a little help. You just handed me a crown jewel. Uh, I was very impressed with it, and I loved reading it, and I hope that shows in my narration. Thank you so much for being with us today, and I hope you will tune in every Friday for more stories shared by new writers. If you're a writer yourself and would be interested in having one of your stories read on our podcast, please go to our website, www.thebuddingwriterpodcast.com, and check out our specifications. My name is Shana Arman, and this was The Budding Writer. Until next time, I hope all your stories have happy endings.